let's uh, finally wrap up uh, Rhythm of War. Um, so, uh, for you guys, uh, this video is coming out one week after my previous video about part five of Rhythm of War. Uh, for me, it's been over a month since I recorded that video. Uh, I am on a different continent than I was when I recorded that video. Um, I don't really have a very good reason for that. I just kind of put off recording this video uh, for reasons that are unclear even to myself. Uh, for some reason, recording this video was giving me a lot of anxiety. I think because it felt like it was going to be the last uh, the, like, the grand finale, I guess, of my journey through the Cosmere. Um, and in a way it is, but I realized, uh, recently that it also isn't. And the reason it isn't is because I'm pretty sure I have enough of a backlog that at the current rate of uploading videos, this video should come out at a time when the last medal has already been released. So it's quite possible that if I get the last medal at release and read it uh, and read it quickly enough, I will actually be able to just continue with weekly uploads of Cosmere videos uh, for several more weeks after this. Uh, and even if not, it'll be at most a couple of weeks break. Uh, now, I do already know what I'm going to read next. Uh, I've sort of taken a break. Well, I, I was going to say I've taken a break from reading, but that's not true. I've read some books, but I've taken a break from reading books for the channel uh, for uh, for this month or so. And I think that's also another reason why I haven't recorded uh, this video for a while. Uh, I wanted to sort of give myself some time uh, to take a break from reading stuff for the channel. Uh, and now I'm ready to get back. Uh, to reading stuff for the channel. Uh, so I'm recording this. Um, anyway, that's enough of an introduction. Uh, let's talk about what this video is. Because this video is not just uh, the second part of my Part 5 of Rhythm of War video. Uh, it is also a wrap-up video of several other things. Uh, specifically, I have now read... Uh, in fact, I read a month ago, the Stormlight Book 5 prologue. Uh, and I've also gone uh, wiki diving. Uh, and I've read a bunch of stuff that... Uh, a bunch of fan theories, a bunch of stuff that I've missed in the books or forgotten about. Um... And a bunch of stuff that Brandon has talked about outside of um, outside of the actual books, stuff that he's mentioned at book signings and on his website and so forth, various uh, reveals that he's dropped uh, outside of that. Um, so I am now basically f also I've read White Sand uh, for what that's worth, which is very little. Uh, so I'm now basically. Uh, fully caught up with all the knowledge of the Cosmere that anyone really has, I think, unless I'm missing something. Um, the only thing I haven't read are the uh, non-canon books such as Way of Kings Prime and Dragonsteel Prime. Um, but yeah, that's a... Uh, that's where I'm at. I now know everything that you know, assuming you've been a long-time Cosmere fan who sort of absorbed all the information that there is to absorb. Um, and I'm going to talk about it. But first, I'm going to talk about some of the stuff from Rhythm of War that I didn't talk about in the last video. Uh, in particular, let's finally talk about the biggest plot twist in the entirety of Stormlight Archive, probably in the entirety of the Cosmere, maybe in any fantasy book I've ever read. Which is... Teravangian. Killing Rays and becoming Odium. 
holy shit. I was not, uh, well, I was gonna say I was not prepared for that, but that's not actually true. I actually had the theory that Teravangian might become Odium. I didn't share that theory because it was just sort of a vague idea I had in my head. I actually had this idea that we were building up towards, well, I was pretty certain we would see someone other than Rays become Odium, and I actually thought Teravangian was a pretty likely candidate. But I was still completely shocked when it happened because I was expecting that to happen at the end of book five. That felt like the sort of thing that you would end one act of the Stormlight Archive with uh, and then do a time skip and then deal with the consequences afterwards. Uh, but no, Sanderson has decided to boldly... Uh, kill off the main antagonist four books into a ten-book series. Uh, <laughs> I'm very curious to see how that will go. Uh, I think great, actually, because uh, I've, I think I've complained before that Odium is not a very interesting villain. Uh, I, it's not... It wasn't a problem, per se, but he was just kind of your bog-standard Dark Lord... Uh, in a way that felt like it belonged in a different era of fantasy. Uh, he felt very much like, uh, like, you know, like the Dark One from The Wheel of Time. Uh, which made sense because, of course, uh, Brandon's biggest inspiration for Stormlight Archive is The Wheel of Time. Um, but it was also kind of like, you know, it's, it's fine, it works as a, as it, it, it works as a trope. Uh, it sets up stuff for other characters to play off of, but it's a little bit uninspired uh, as, as like, a villain who's just motivated by world domination or destroying the world or whatever. Uh, and that's where I think this was a stroke of genius, because I've mentioned before that Teravangian is maybe the most interesting and most developed and most complex character in the entirety of the Stormlight Archive. Teravangian uh, has had a ton of development put into him as a character. Uh, way out of proportion with how much screen time he's actually had, by the way. Like, he is a more interesting and complex and developed character than some of our protagonists uh, in this story. And therefore replacing the potentially boring and uninteresting villain with him is a stroke of genius. Uh, and I am incredibly excited for the next book because of that. I want to see what Teravangian is going to do with this power. And already the little hints we get here at the end uh, seem to sort of suggest how this is going to go. Uh, so I want to talk about a couple of things with Teravangian. First of all, it's made explicitly clear that the change in Vessel has not actually freed him from any of the um, any of the limitations that Odium had. He is still bound by the Oath Pact, and he is still bound by his new deal with Dalinar. The, the deal race made with Dalinar does hold Teravangian just as firmly. Uh, so this isn't uh, this isn't a loophole out of any of those limitations, which I'm I'm glad to hear. I think that would be a bit cheap uh, to just invalidate all those rules that Odium was bound by. Uh, and I think it's going to be more interesting seeing Teravangian work within those limitations than having him just break out of them completely. Which I do think he will do at the end of the next book. I think, like, the obvious conclusion for part one of the Stormlight Archive is and always has been Odium breaking fully free. Um, but... Uh, I will enjoy reading a whole book of Teravangian uh, having to work within his limits. Um, secondly, uh, one thing I really like with Teravangian, now that he is Odium, is that his sides have actually switched roles in a weird way. Up until now, uh, Teravangian has had two sides. There's been quote-unquote stupid Teravangian or dumb Teravangian, who is actually... Uh, his actual primary characteristic is that he is 
emotional Teravangian. And then there is the cold, calculating, smart Teravangian who is pure intellect and no emotion. And so far, uh, the latter has always been the evil Teravangian. The Teravangian who is antagonistic to the other characters is the one who is cold and calculating and hyper-rational, whereas the emotions-driven Teravangian is the one who has wanted to do the right thing and do, and do good by others so far, and the one who has sort of held back the worst excesses of the intelligent Teravangian. And now we've kind of switched. There are no longer... These are no longer separate personas, so to speak. He is both of these people at once now. But it is very clear that now that he is Odium, it is his in intellect, his, uh, his rational side, that is going to want to keep doing the right thing with this newfound power, whereas his emotional side is, by virtue of the nature of Odium's power, going to be highly susceptible to the influence of that power and going to be pulled towards acting more in concert with what Odium the Shard wants, which is evil. Uh, so that is something that I find very, uh, very interesting, that we're going to essentially see... Uh, we're going to see within a single character uh, this swap of two characters, kind of. Uh, which... As I said, makes is is like that's part of the reason why I think Teravangian is such a compelling character uh, because he allows you to do stuff like that as a writer. Next, uh, there is his conversation with Cultivation, and during this conversation, uh, it is a it, that is a fascinating conversation because it is not clear at all who has the upper hand there. Um, at first glance, the first impression you get from that conversation is that cultivation is out of her depth, that she's screwed up, that she was essentially counting on Teravangian um, being a better man, or easier to manipulate at least, uh, than he actually is, um, and that she was counting on this being the solution to all of her problems, but now it's actually going to be even worse because of who Teravangian is and what he's planning. I don't think this is true. I think... I think that Cultivation knows who Teravangian is, and that whatever Teravangian is going to do next is going to play into her hand. Because we still don't know what Cultivation wants. This little scene seems to imply that Cultivation is a good guy, and that she wants what's best for everyone, and she wants to preserve life and so forth. I don't know that that's true. We've established that cultivation wants change and growth and evolution. What if cultivation's goal is to bring change and growth to the status quo of the entire Cosmere? And the only way to do that is to essentially unleash odium upon it. That, I think, could be an interesting twist. What if the ultimate antagonist of the Stormlight Archive, and maybe even the Cosmere as a whole, ends up being not Odium, but Cultivation? I'm very uh, excited to see if I'm right about that. Uh, but that is currently where my mind is at. The second uh, sort of mutual manipulation scene we get with Odium here, uh, or Teravangian, rather, is Teravangian and Hoyd in the epilogue. And here I have seen lots of fans theorize that Hoyd is actually the one with the upper hand here, that Hoyd knows what happened, that he figured that he that he's figured it out, and he's actually pretending to be tricked in order to trick Teravangian. That I don't buy. I think that this is a straightforward case of Hoyd being just completely outmatched. Hoyd being outplayed and outsmarted 100% by Teravangian here. Uh, I think that's what's going on because I think that makes it more interesting. I think that's more in that's more interesting as a as a storytelling beat. 
Um, and, and it's also, I think, in character, because Hoyd, while he is very experienced and very smart, is also very cocky and has a lot of confidence that he can predict how other people will react. That he knows, uh, that he basically has other people wrapped around his little finger. So if he has, and he thinks that he knows who race is, and he thinks that he's got him played completely. And that's why Teravangian becoming Odium uh, is something that's going to massively throw off Hoyd. Um, because he doesn't know Teravangian. Even if he knew that Teravangian had become Odium, it would throw off his plan, because he can't predict what Teravangian is going to do the way he could with race. But, uh, but I don't think he knows. I don't think he's figured it out. I think what we see in the epilogue is straightforwardly what happened. Hoyd has now been tricked and deceived into thinking that Odium is still race. Um... At least that's my theory. It's, it's possible I'm wrong about both of these. Maybe Cultivation is the one who's been outsmarted and Hoyt is the one who is doing the outsmarting. But I think it's the other way around right now. I think Cultivation knows exactly what's going on and has the upper hand over Teravangian. And I think Teravangian just kicked Hoyt's ass uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of outsmarting him. Um... Yeah, that's really all I have to say about this massive plot twist, because it happened so late in the game. Um, I will say I appreciate that Teravangian becoming Odium wasn't the end of the book. Uh, that feels like the sort of moment... I've, I've talked about this before, I think, in Words of Radiance, but it's one of those moments that I think a less confident and experienced author would have made the epilogue, like... The moment of Teravang like the the sentence Teravangian became odium, ascended and became odium, uh, would have been the final line of the book. Uh, but and it would have been like a memorable, dramatic climax, certainly, but Brandon is, I think, a bit more skilled than that, and a bit more confident in his own abilities than that, and in his audience. So he doesn't need to leave us hanging on a cliffhanger like that. Instead, he gives us the massive plot twist, and then he gives us, like, almost a hundred more pages of book after that, uh, fully dealing with the, fault, the consequences of that plot twist. And, of course, there's still a lot of consequences left to see, but we do get to see some of them here immediately. We get to see several chapters of Teravangian as Odium, interacting with other characters, uh, which I think was a brilliant choice. Uh, I complained in the previous video about how the climaxes outside of Urethiru didn't feel very coherent, and that's still true, I still agree with that, but this particular climax in a vacuum was handled very well, even though I still think it could have maybe been narratively integrated more with some of the other ones. Um, okay, so that's all I have to say about Teravangian, I think. Uh, the other major thing from part five of, um, Rhythm of War that I, I don't think I talked about in the last video, I might have, I hope I'm not gonna repeat myself here, is Ishar. And specifically, the power that Ishar wields. We see here, in Ishar, the full, unlimited power of a, um, of a bondsmith. And holy shit, uh, some of the things that Ishar here does and some of the things he implies that he could do, such as taking away the bond between Dalinar and Odium that makes Odium perceive Dalinar as his enemy, uh, or taking away Dalinar's bond with the Stormfather, uh, these are completely insane abilities, and it is now becoming extremely clear how unchained bondsmiths could have destroyed the previous uh, homeworld uh, of Roshar's humans. Uh, 
I mean, the exact details aren't clear, but it's becoming clear that they did, in fact, have the power to do that. Um, I am wondering if we are going to find out that all of the other, uh, all of the other forms of surge binding are also that absurdly overpowered when you are at full power. Because so far, uh, we've really only seen, uh, we've really only seen, we've seen a bondsmith at full power. Uh, we have seen a skybreaker at full power in the form of a nail, and it wasn't that impressive. Like, nail, nail is, I mean, nail is powerful, but he's not like, I don't know. It, it it was it didn't feel like the sort of overpowered godlike abilities that we see from Ishar here. Um, and at first, I would be tempted to say that that's just because bondsmiths are special, but we do also see at the end of Oathbringer uh, a fourth ideal um, fourth ideal else caller in the form of Yasna and. Yasna, at the end of Oathbringer, is one of the most terrifying godlike forces of destruction um, imaginable. So, clearly, else callers, once they get to the higher levels of their powers, are also just incredibly overpowered. Uh, and it makes me wonder whether we're going to see that eventually with Kaladin and Shallan and all of the others as well. Um, yeah, uh, I don't really have a lot of theories about Ishar. We only get this one scene with him, so I still don't quite know what his deal is. I don't know why he's got physically manifested spren dissected in a room. I, I mean, I'm sure... It's pretty clear that whatever Ishar's deal is, is going to be the main thrust of probably Kaladin and Seth's storyline in the next book. Once they get to, um, once they get to Shinovar. Um, I am, uh, I'm very, I think, like, out of all the storylines from the next book, I think Kaladin and Seth is going to be the one I'm most intrigued to see both because of plot reasons and because I think those two interacting is just going to be very fun. <laughs> Not fun for them, but probably very fun for me to read. Uh, and also, I desperately want to see uh, Sill and Nightblood interacting. I think Sill and Nightblood are going to have some fantastic back-and-forth banter between them uh, that I cannot wait to see. Um... But yeah, those are the two main, those are the two big plot things that I didn't talk about in the last video, uh, as far as Rhythm of War is concerned. Now I'm going to talk about a couple of things that are revealed or implied in the Stormlight 5 prologue. So, first of all, the thing that is basically outright revealed, at least if you've read Mistborn Era 2, so spoilers for that as well, um, Kelsier is Thydekar. Uh, so apparently a lot of people figured this out earlier, based on him being referred to as the Lord of Scars. Uh, a lot of, uh, looking at the wiki, apparently this was something that Brandon was asked about long before the Stormlight 5 prologue was released, and he confirmed it. So the fandom as a whole has known that Kelsier is Thydekar for a while. Um, but, uh, I certainly didn't pick up on that at all. <laughs> the Lord of Scars thing didn't tip me off at all. I, I ended Rhythm of War 100% convinced that Thydekar was, uh, was an avatar of autonomy. Uh, but no, apparently Thydekar is Kelsier, uh, which I, well, I don't know what to make of that, but, oh, sorry, I'm getting a... I'm getting texts. Let's just mute that. Yeah, but I do actually um, have a uh, have 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 a fun little theory there. So remember, in last video, I I put forth the theory that Trell is Dalinar. Uh, I still believe that. Uh, 
And yes, there is a potential bit of counter evidence to that in White Sand. I don't know what to make of that. I think it's very minor and could be easily chalked up to literally anything. Uh, so I'm not I'm not going to say that that disproves my theory. Uh, I think that uh, I'm I'm very confident actually that the Trell is Dalinar. And I think that Kelsier being Thytokar is actually kind of circumstantial evidence in favor of that. And the reason is, on a purely metatextual level, Trell being Dalinar would be really interesting because it would mean that a major Stormlight Archive villain is one of the Mistborn protagonists and a major Mistborn villain is one of the Stormlight protagonists. And I just think that would be really neat. Uh, and if Brandon is smart, it would be something he would do, in my opinion. <laughs> uh, I could be wrong, and maybe what we'll get instead is going to be just as cool or interesting, but for me... Until proven otherwise, which might happen already in the last medal. Uh, lost medal? Last medal? Forget. Anyway, um, yeah. I, I don't think, um, I don't think we're going to see, uh, anything else happen right now. This is my current working theory. So, uh... I do want to talk a bit more about that theory, actually, before I move on to the other thing from the prologue. I do want to just say, there is a compelling counter-argument to that theory. And that counter-argument is that Brandon has confirmed that the metal that is associated with Trell, which, we are, which is called Trellium, that that metal... Um, it is Trell's god metal. And it is... And if Trell is Dalinar, uh, then the god metal associated with Trell would be Odium's uh, god metal. And in Rhythm of War, we see Odium's god metal, Raceum. Uh, we see what it looks like. And it is explicitly described... And it definitely looks nothing like what we see of Trellium. So Trellium, just factually, 100%, is not Racium. And that seems like it basically disproves my theory all on its own. But I don't think it does. Because the god medals are not named for the shards, the god medals are named for the vessels. Uh, Sazed's god medals are not the god metals of the shards that he holds. Uh, instead, he has a new god metal, because he, the vessel, is a new person. Uh, my theory is that Trellium is not Racium, but that Trellium is actually Teravangium. I don't know whether I, I don't know whether that's how it works, but the fact that all of the metals are named after the vessels instead of the shards, to me, seems like pretty strong evidence that there's now going to be a new god metal for the new wielder of the shard. Um, that being said, uh, I don't know if I'm right about that. What I am much more certain I'm right about is something that a lot of fans are now pretty sure of, which is that Shalon's mom was a herald. Uh, specifically the herald Chanarach. Chanarach? Shanarash? That could be pronounced in a lot of different ways, actually, and I'm, I, my Vorin pronunciation is not that good. I, I, like, the one thing I've managed to learn about Vorin pronunciation is that the letter J is pronounced Y instead of J. Uh, so I know that Yasna is Yasna, but I don't know how to pronounce this particular herald's name. Um, but I do think that this particular herald is Shalon's mom. Um, 
And, uh, and, and, you know, if you've read the Stormlight 5, 5 prologue and read some fan theories about it, you'll know why. Uh, the Stormlight 5 prologue uh, takes place uh, at basically the exact same time that Shallan's mom dies. Um, and... We know, and in the Stormlight Five prologue, there is a moment where the Stormfather suddenly has this reaction of, "Oh my God, one of the heralds has died!" Like he just says that. And in the context, it's possible he's lying because he is like the Stormfather lies a lot in the Stormlight Five prologue. Uh, but that didn't feel like a lie. That felt like something that actually happened. And also, it would explain why the desolation started. So, if this theory is correct, Shallan caused the final desolation. She killed her mom, sending, uh, sending one of the heralds back to uh, Damnation, where she promptly uh, did not withstand more than, a, more than a couple of years of torture before breaking and letting the desolations back out. Um... I think this theory is too good to not be true. It is too interesting and fits too perfectly to not be true. Um, and it would also add another layer to Shalon's sort of guilt, uh, guilt-filled guilt backstory. Because if she finds out that on top of everything else she already blames herself for, she also literally started the desolation. <laughs> Uh, that would probably take her character in some very interesting directions in the next book. So I do think this is true. Um, and the final thing I want to talk about here at the end is the Stormlight 5 prologue in general. Uh, because I really like what Sanderson is doing with Gavilar. So Gavilar uh, has been steadily over the course of the prologues so far, um, been revealed to be a worse and worse person. Every book's prologue makes Gavilar seem worse. In the first book's prologue, he is a heroic king. There is basically no flaws in Gavilar Colin in the first book. The second book's prologue reveals that he was kind of a shitty dad, uh, but okay, he might still have been a, good in other ways. The third book's prologue uh, reveals that he was trying to bring back the, the, the Voidbringers, uh, which is, you know, pretty strong evidence that he was a, t a terrible person, that he had evil goals. The fourth book pro book's prologue reveals that he was just a straight-up monster in terms of his personal life and his relationship to his family members, especially Navani. And then the fifth book's prologue <laughs> Reveals that on top of all of that, he was also a moron. <laughs> Which I found very amusing. I was incredibly amused by the reveal that he was just kind of a bumbling idiot in addition to being an evil mastermind. Like, he was an evil mastermind who was completely wrong about everything and just fell for the most obvious lies. Uh... Obviously, the prologue of Stormlight 5 isn't canon yet. It might still be edited. Everything in it is subject to change until the release of the book. So, uh, I'm not going to spend too much talking about it. I just wanted to say that I really, really liked uh, that particular aspect of it. Uh, I will, of course, be rereading it once the full book is released, uh, and I can read the final version of it. Uh, and then I will talk more about it, especially if something has changed uh, in the, um, ugh, unfortunately, in the two years between now and then. It's going to be a while before we get that book. Ugh. Anyway, uh, that is all I have to say uh, about this particular book uh, for now. Uh, I've mentioned before that I will eventually be making videos about the, the Cosmere that are not just um, me going through the books. I might do some, you know, tier list videos, theory videos, and stuff like that eventually. For now, though, uh, chances are the next Cosmere video I make is probably going to be uh, 
the first video of me reading the the next Mistborn book, uh, which is the the Lost Metal, which again I think I think is already out when you're watching this, um, even though it is over a month away from release for me right now recording this. Um, but if there does end up being a week's gap in the schedule. I might start. Uh, I might start uploading some other videos uh, that I'm going to be recording uh, for the next series that I'm going to be reading after the Cosmere, um, which I'm actually going to start reading uh, right after this video, right after making this video. Um, I have. A, I, I already know what it is. I've got the books. And I'm going to start reading it now. Uh, so, I hope you have a very very nice day. Um, and I hope you, uh, I hope you stick around for whatever happens next on this channel, uh, even if it isn't the Cosmere, because, uh, well, maybe you can even read along with what I'm going to be reading next. See you around. Bye!